Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this panel today is a continuum from a conversation we had last year, Women in Jazz, the gender equity question. For those of you who had the opportunity to come last year, we had a very rich conversation uh, where we talked about women in jazz but I think it was, the conversation was a little different than some audience members might have thought we would. Uh, so I wanna start today by introducing the panel. The panel begins with Melissa Aldana. Yeah. Cecile mclaurin Salvan. <laughs> Bria Skonberg. Right, Ingrid Jensen, <laughs> and Tia Fuller. <laughs> Our two incredible artists in residence for this year's Monterey Jazz Fest, let me say, and they have just done a magnificent job. Just so appreciated. My name is Susan Jenkins, and I am very humbled and pleased to have the opportunity to have this conversation today. I think it's an important conversation as we look at what's going on in the world. The conversation that we had last year, we wanted to talk about equity and, and what that looked like or what inequity was looking like. Last year, the panel started talking about things that made many of the panelists feel quite uncomfortable, I think, and had had experiences throughout their career that needed to be addressed. Uh, when we're talking about inequity here, we're not talking just about equality, because sometimes when things are equal, they're still inequitable. We're talking about systems change, I think, in institutions, in um, implicit biases that people have, the way that the world works in ways that is inherently inequitable. And I think what we heard last year from some of the panelists were, were that while delivering the same product or perhaps even a product at a higher level, we were being judged women in jazz were being judged at di with different standards in mind. And so today we're, we're here to talk about that and, and to ask what that experience has been for several of our panelists. And I want to begin with two of the panelists that we had uh, last year, Ingrid and Tia, as we talk about our panel last year was in September. And then it was before the Me Too movement really broke out. While we have been talking about inequity as far as women and women in jazz, women as professionals, women in the world, and we've been talking about inequity for a very long time, after our panel this year, a lot of things happened. Um, and today I'd like, a, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things that we heard about what was happening in institutions um, and, and, and an example or two of what that inequity looked like then and then we'll take it from there and go to what's happening now. And really we'd like to end today with some practical ideas about what can be done to address inequity rather than just talking about what it is. <laughs> yeah, let's start with dancing. <laughs> Today is my birthday and that was my daughter calling. Ooh, happy birthday. <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's on Do Not Disturb, but it's still <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Anyhow, so we do want to talk about. Oh. Wow, you are I really need very to turn popular. It off. So hold on, hold on a second. Yeah. It's a good ringtone, though. Yeah, so we do want to talk about what that um, inequity has looked like and to end today with some practical ideas about what can be done. And I, I think a lot can still be done and needs to be done in order to address the inequities that so many women in jazz are facing. So Tia, let's talk a little bit about what we uh, discussed last year. We talked about institutional inequities. Um, can you talk about some of the things that have happened um, uh, that you've noticed, and, and, and then I want to talk about some, what some of the course corrections that are being made in institutions. Yeah, um, oh, is this on? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Peggy? There we go. Testing, testing. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, it's really great to be a part of this panel again. Um, and uh, so... Uh, as you all know or don't know, I, I teach at Berkeley College of Music, and um, and there are a lot of things that have happened within the course, specifically over the course of the past year, year and a half, um, in looking at the equity within the school, and um, and some of the things, well, that we have been dealing with is uh, allegations, you know, toward uh, um, male figures. Um, toward professors who have either spoken inappropriately to young ladies or um, have uh, engaged in, in uh, engaged with students, female students, uh, inappropriately. And so the things that are, <laughs> that are in place now at this point um, is that a lot of, um, well, in particular, uh, I know in the, they have implemented putting windows in all of the um, rooms. Rehearsal and, rooms. Yeah, rehearsal rooms and also private lesson rooms. But mm-hmm. this is some. I'm just kind of launching into it. Um, Please do. Uh, this is something that I guess generally it would be uh, something that... Um, People will be like, yeah, that makes sense, just to make sure that, um, you know, you're not in this confined space with uh, the opposite sex of, of or what, what have you, just being in a confined space, period. With anyone, right. Yeah, with anyone. And um, I'm really being careful as speaking not in uh, binary terms, but, you know, because we have to also look at that, yeah. too. Uh, but... But this has caused some problems as well in that a lot of, um, well, one in particular, but I know that there's conversation in w- one of the departments that um, they didn't have the privacy with the student. And so there was a lot of distraction because it was in a highly traffic trafficked area in the hallway and students will be coming in, you know, peeking into their uh, lessons. And so it's it's this constant balancing act as to how to deal with uh, I don't know if that's necessarily inequity, but just how to healthily balance this this thing of um, creating safer spaces. Uh-huh. Um, and this kind of preempts, um, I'm a part of a collective called We Have Voice, and, and I'm going to have to pull it up online, but we basically have come up with... Um, uh, code of conduct that we have it, it's a collection of 14 different women throughout the performing arts and it's all volunteer basis we have multiple emails <laughs> uh, daily and it's just uh, in-depth emails just about how to to uh, attack this inequity um, throughout the performing arts system um, but just being being able to target okay what does this look like uh, how does it manifest in the educational realm how does it manifest in the performance realm and also in social settings that are branches of the performance realm like right. just hanging in the club or after the club you know with the boys or with the girls and so um, I'm going to pull this up just to, these are clear um, points, like bullet points that we can all really hold ourselves accountable to. Um, and I mean, I'd like to pass it off to Ingrid because we were actually discussing this earlier as to, it's not just men to women or women to men, but a lot of times women to women, we're the hardest on each other based off of this patriarchal mindset that has been imprinted and instilled in us because of this westernized society. Yep, it's this implicit bias that we carry with us. And we don't even know that it's a bias against other women, against other trumpeters, against other singers. We don't even recognize that this bias that's been sewn into the tapestry of our being is showing up in ways that prohibit us from from really reaching out and helping others Mm -hmm. come forward. So what did that conversation sound like, Ingrid? Kind of bummed me out, because when I was at Berkeley, I used to make out in the, some of the practice rooms. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> it was part of my growing years, you know? I won't name any names.
things, but man, <laughs> those little windows you could cover up with some score paper. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would what practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you practiced, it sound like, in many yeah, different yeah, yeah. ways. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to break the ice there. It was yeah, getting yeah, so yeah, serious. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but really, that's all I was thinking about. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's just changing from the top down, I find, too, in uh, management and people with perspectives of how jazz gets to look these days. That's helpful. Um, those of us who have been, you know, the pioneers along the way, I think, have helped. I look back at some of the covers of me playing trumpet in Berkeley magazine from the 80s, and I'm like, I was the only improvising trumpet player, mm -hmm. let alone horn player in the school at yeah. that time. And it took years and years to see another picture. And now, fortunately, Tia's there, and she's all over. <laughs> and, and, and the, you know, the results of, of top-down decision-making of who's going to be in these positions to be influential to the youth and um, I'm fortunate to be asked to do some things recently too that I think are part of this wave of change I'm teaching at uh, Manhattan School of Music now Stefan Harris just lobbied me I don't have time but I said yes <laughs> <laughs> if anyone knows any of my students tell them I will eventually meet them no we we're working on that part but that you know it was just like really really uh, he's really driven to um, also make the department look like the world and look like the street that we walk out on, and that is so important to the music. Mm -hmm. And you can, and there's also an, an agreement of artistic um, com compatibility in there as well. It's not just let me hire this person and this person and that. But he, you know, in the sense of him hiring me, there is also a real clear connection between the way we teach and the way we hear and want hearing and listening and empathy to be a huge part of the equation in our teaching. So that's gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight. And the students are not definitely not going to, you know, immediately adapt to having this new um, environment around them when it's been a lot of these institutions uh -huh. have fallen into certain patterns of the way right. things go. And I think it even goes back as far as to, um, you know, the school band room. I want to get a fundraiser or some kind of Kickstarter going so that we can get some photos of female instruments, instrumentalists, not female instruments, but female <laughs> instrumentalists. Yeah, the, you know, the flute and the girl and the piano, the, the drums and the guy. Um, no, I didn't mean that. But, you know, in these band rooms, in these band rooms, it's like there's a picture of, you know, the yeah. typical people that are apparently representative of the way jazz looks. And uh, it's just, I've, I've, I'm so frustrated with it at this point. So, yep. hey, donors, how's it going? <laughs> If you don't see yourself, you don't see yourself, right? And the, who, you know, a nine, grade nine trumpet player comes in the room, boy or girl, that's what their image is, is this one Louis Armstrong picture, which is great. I love Louis. And he was an open book as far as accepting anybody to play, but right. they don't know that. Right. Right. And so you, you, you miss out on whatever you might have been able to contribute because you only have one image, and that image is what you're striving for, but some of us could never get there. And images are direct links to Google these days. You see an image, of, oh, who is that? Oh, yeah, look at that, Brace Goldberg. I want to Google that. Wow, that's good music. Yeah. I like that. That's going to make me mm -hmm. keep playing. Absolutely. So without Absolutely. that, it's like, who? Yeah. So when I was asked to do the panel and I <clears throat> reached out to you to talk about this. I, I spoke to Bria, uh, who brings this Canadian perspective. Um, um, and and this, this- I'm Canadian too. Right, right. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is that the perspective that she brought up was that she had never had this same experience that we were talking about. That she grew up in a place where there was a lot of access and a lot of opportunity, and she didn't experience the kind of inequity that we talked about on the panel this year, last year. And so I found that very interesting. Melissa and Cecile also come at this from different perspectives, and I'm interested to hear whether or not this international perspective changes one's view of inequitable situations for women in this music. Cecile, what about you? Um, I'm interested to hear what your experiences were as far as equity. Well, um, so I sing, so that's a different thing, right? It's, it's an expectation that a woman would be a singer of all instruments, right? So I'm not... Um, 
I'm not being radical in that way, uh, which is interesting uh, because I started singing, actually, I started singing jazz in France uh, where everybody was, first of all, didn't really speak English. <laughs> so I'm singing these standards in English as an American, as a woman, and as a black person. So it's, it was kind of like the bands that I was in capitalized on, first of all, the stereotype of the black female singer and also the exoticism of it, even though I am French also, you know? Uh, and even though I do sometimes feel like I come at this music as a, ch as a child of immigrants, you know, jazz is not the music that's culturally of my family, of my ancestry. We're Caribbean, we're French. So I'm coming in a little bit as an outsider and it's something that I've, it's, it's something that I've kind of gotten away with because of the way that I look and the fact that I'm a woman and I'm black. And, you know, so that's something that I kind of think about a lot. I think about identity a lot and what that means. But in terms of like how it was for me starting out, I was always super encouraged, super pushed to the front, um, really, really really pushed by my one teacher that I had. I only had one teacher and he was a clarinet player. And um, he forced me to play the piano, for, like really, you know, put, put me behind the drums sometimes, gave me a saxophone to try, gave me a cornet to try. There, it was, and I obviously failed at all of those, <laughs> all of those things, but he, he, there was no discussion of like, like, oh, you're a singer, you're a woman, you need to sing. Like, it was always like, try this instrument, try this, listen to this. Um, so I, I was pretty lucky. I think, I think, and I don't teach, I'm not in any institutions, I just tour. So the situations that were a little bit problematic were situations that I had on tour with musicians whether it's conversations, whether it's weirdness, whether it's actually like being in a hotel room like with the door locked, like nervous that somebody's gonna come in and do something inappropriate. So that's my, that's been my experience. So it's been pretty lucky. And I, I guess in a way I'm fascinated with the idea of like with, with what these women's experiences are in terms of the music because it's, I think it's just like a different, it's, you get a different experience if you're playing an instrument, if it's just, if you get to a jam session and you have an instrument with you as a woman, I think it's probably very different than if you come in like, let's, let's sing this song, you know, I, I think, uh -huh. but maybe I'm, mm -hmm. should I apologize already for what I've said? <laughs> I'm gonna, well, I, everything I say, I'm gonna apologize afterwards because I'm a woman, I'm sorry. Well, I think, no, right. I think that perspective of what women do, they come and they sing, you know, that is, that is a bias that people have about what women do in the music. And so the fact that you are a singer um, and an incredible storyteller, I think that that, that probably is makes people feel more comfortable, but the stories you tell are not always that comfortable. Well, I guess that's where the, that's where it comes in is that I really love to deal with um, feminist material, sexist material, racist material, um, and um, things that are uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable, because maybe I present as this, you know, come here, we're gonna have, and I've had people tell me before like, why are you not singing? Like I did this, this really great, this incredible piece that Jelly Roll Morton did. Um, it's called Murder Ballad. It's a 30 minute blues uh, about this woman who kills her man's mistress. Then she ends up going to jail. She has a lesbian relationship in jail. Then she thinks about her own death and it's filled with profanity. There's like, serious delving into like sex between women. And I sang this at Jazz at Lincoln Center at like 7 p.m. Yes. Yes. <laughs> on a <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, some people came like on a date and I remember saying, I don't, if, are there children? 
Are there children out There's here? Children. Are there yeah, children in the some. audience right okay, now? Okay, there might be some. I said the C word, mm. you know, yeah. loudly. <laughs> and um, I remember receiving an email like, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, <laughs> what, can we not just have like some nice standards, nice romantic can't, standards? Can't, can't we all just get along? Yeah. Can't you Safe. behave? <laughs> Properly. Yeah. So. Yeah. So maybe that's. So maybe because I don't play an instrument and because I don't have to, I don't have that. Or maybe I'm adding on certain mm -hmm. um, struggles in terms of the material that I deal with. I think I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is intentional. <laughs> what you're doing is in intentional, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, yeah. Melissa. T tell us a little bit about what your experience has been. Chilean, saxophonist, but I understand that you come from a musical family, so yeah. perhaps there was a lot of support, or maybe not. Yeah, so I have a weird story. Um, my grandfather and my father, they're both tenor players, you know, so I grew up at home seeing my father practicing all day and with a lot of students. He used to do like a lot of group lessons, you know, and I was usually the only woman. But I guess my dad was just trying to challenge me or piss me off. <laughs> so when we were doing the group lessons, like I remember we were all learning a, a solo by Bram for Marsalis, Chick to Chick. And the challenge was like, who learned the solo first by heart, you know? And we had, I dealt with a lot of situations through the years with my dad like that. And he always will said, yeah, you did a good for being a woman, you know. And I was, I was like 10, 15, and, and that never made me insecure. That just made me so pissed that I will go and learn the solo in two keys, you know, and then just, you know, and so, like, I, nev I never took it in a negative way. And, and I believe that, like, if you're strong with what you are and the story that you say and as strong as a musician and, you know, um, that comes across, and then the gender thing kind of gets away, you know. Um, and I always believe that um, even though I don't have any bad experiences as being a female, you know, I always felt respected, but I will say that the only time that I thought about it was when I won the monk competition. Mm -hmm. Because when I was at the competition, I didn't even thought, oh, I'm a woman, I'm the only woman here. That didn't even cross my mind. I just wanted to make sure I will just be perform as natural as possible and just have fun. That is all what I care. But then after I won the competition, I start checking things on social media a little bit too much, you know, and a lot of guys were pissed, you know, and they were saying, yeah, you won it because you're a woman, you know. And I remember after I won, I was super drunk. <laughs> and we were all partying, and then one of the guys that was on competition, he came to me, he was pretty drunk, and he, and, and he said, like, you won it, but you were playing the same thing over and over just because you're a woman. And he was actually really pissed, you know. So I think that is the only time that I felt, um, you know, I felt, I felt it, you know. But besides that, I have to tell you, like, I'm aware that it's there, you know, and I'm aware that um, there are women that deal with this, you know, but I've been pretty lucky in the sense that I feel respected, you know, and, and I think that the fact that I had my father saying, like, you do it good for being a woman and just <laughs> being peace, you know, it kind of forced me to um, just make me think and want to just be as, as good as I can't, you know. I don't know. That's my, my Thank experience. You. <laughs> Thank you. I find it interesting that both you and Cecile said that you feel lucky that you haven't faced gender inequity. And I guess my feeling is that no one should be facing what I know that some women face, whether it's you play okay as a woman or why don't you just sing some nice songs. I mean, the whole idea that we are uh, in our place causes me such incredible amount of discomfort. <laughs> um, and that I, I just have to wonder if others are told, um, are, are made to feel lucky when they don't have to suffer the same types of inequities. And that uh, I find intriguing. Uh, Bria, uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the things you and I discussed about 
how nurturing the environment was. And probably Ingrid, you know, if you have anything else you want to jump in on. I, I found that part of our conversation really quite intriguing. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Well, I should, I should say that, you know, my experience doesn't necessarily represent all of Canada <laughs> by any means whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I grew up in a wonderful um, community, a city called Chilliwack, British Columbia, <laughs> um, a part of the public school band program uh, is where I got my, my start. And when I started, there were six other girls playing trumpet. So, and it, I just didn't feel special along the way. And when I got through high school, Two of my best friends, all girls, we were all playing lead. We were all playing the top parts in the jazz band. And and uh, going into college, the lead player in the top band was a female. You know, it just it just was. And I didn't think about it. And important, most importantly, my teachers didn't treat me any differently because of it. I think that's a big part of it, you know, how people are prepared to treat uh, young females. Um, so, I mean, maybe, I don't know, like Melissa, but I, I didn't really think about it. I didn't really think about it. Or if I, or if there was some, it was just more, you know, I liked the challenge. I liked uh, competing a little bit with the guys in the class. I don't know, that made me feel, feel strong, actually, uh, to, to come out on top <laughs> and practice and use that as motivation along the way. Um, so, all that said, I mean, and I want to say that actually... I was a pretty shy kid. I remember, I feel like I'm a trained extrovert, but the trumpet really gave me a lot of uh, confidence. It, it has opened up my personality in ways that can never be taken back, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, just the, uh, the, the uh, character of the, the instrument um, led me to get more involved in leadership type roles. I mean, uh -huh. I was really on school sports, student council, et cetera, all the way through high school. And then when I graduated, uh, we had a, a combo, a traditional jazz combo. My, my, my teachers, they, um, uh, they gave me the music of Louis Armstrong to learn, uh, which was a big feat at 15 and still is. Um, but I didn't question it. I just knew that I was the one who wanted to, you know, who was being challenged at that time by my teacher. They'd give me recordings, they'd give me transcriptions, and I would learn them or transcribe them. Uh -huh. um, anyway, so right after high school, I, I kept the band together. Most of us went into music, so I kept that band together. I got on the phone and started trying to book gigs and, and was always leading my own projects kind of from the get-go because I think I understood, realized pretty quick that nobody else was going to do it for me. Um, so... Being in that position, uh, you know, based on the encouragement from my family too, and my my teachers and my peers, and having that community, just was always a, a point of strength. And as far as you know, I, having um, always led my own bands, I, I don't get a lot of I don't get a lot of sass from members when I'm the one writing the check. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> and also there were females in the band, you know, it just, it, it kind of just was, and I, I'm not going to use the word lucky, <laughs> but I realize how rare that is yeah. now as more and more. And as this, this, this past year in conversation has really, you know, developed a fire in me about these topics and to hear other people's stories is just, just adding to that and really understanding the position of these women and women like these two who are making it so I really appreciate <laughs> both of you for so many reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Working hard. Yeah. Yeah. So Ingrid, do you feel, did, so I'm wondering if your experience was similar and as a result, when you came into a setting that you saw and felt was truly inequitable, you know, how you were able to move through that and still do this incredible work that you do. Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, I wish my situation was the same. I, even though we did have a lot of female students in our band, it turned out that the band director was abusing them. So that's why there were so many that's girls coming in and out of the program. So it was a negative, and I knew it, and I caught on to it quickly. And I, Did you uh, tell anybody about it? It was so, it was, I was in grade nine. When he hit on me, I kicked him in the shins and ran away. And uh, my daughter has the same feist, and she is learning that same feist. <laughs> but it's so, it's such a drag, you know, that it, it had to be for those reasons. And at the same time, my mom, because of who she was, she was such a rock. She was a great musician. She always encouraged me just, you know, to rise above everything through music, right. which she did. She raised three girls by herself with no child support, and at night would play the piano. 
to calm herself. <laughs> there was no Ridlin or no Xanax back then. It was just like, I got me All some stride. I'm gonna play this. <laughs> and that was it. I'll put some Oscar Peterson on. It was simpler times, yet more complicated. Um, yeah, so the, we learned really, really early on what a meditation music was, and what a what an escape in many ways too. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it would have been nice to know how to have the conversation and yeah. clear things up a little more quickly and be believed. Right. Some yeah. of the girls weren't believed. Nobody believed me. And then when I finally found out in my twenties that I was right all along, I was like, "Damn, that sucks," because this was one of my idols and. Um, you know, these things have to be called out right now. My daughter was just asking, what, you know, I said, what do you do when someone bullies you at school? Well, first of all, I tell them to stop, and then I tell a teacher. I'm like, good, okay, that's a start. And, you know, and then my husband goes, and you also need to know how to read the signs when you need to move away from that. Mm -hmm. And so that's the next element of education, too, is to be able to have that understanding of what's going on. I mean, that's bullying, but it's, they're kind of the same. It's difficult, though, when you're in these settings and you really need something from the person, right? They're your instructor. Oh, yeah. They're the head of the composition department. They are whatever. They are helping you figure out how your tour is going to go. I mean, who knows Different all the different things that people need as we move through the work that you do. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult and uh, trying to figure out what that balance is by, you know, I need to tell the truth, but I also really need to get a grade, mm -hmm. uh, get this faculty position, whatever. I mean, how, how is it? What, what tools do we need to have in our arsenal to be able to get through this and still, and still feed the creative? Because at the end of the day, this has got to be, as you said, and it was interesting, your body language was interesting, because you hugged yourself. It's, it's, it's that visceral yeah. to be in these settings, and it, that cuts off creativity. So, so what kinds of things do we need to help people understand that, that you need in order for you to feed your muse? Mm. Yeah, you go with that. Yeah. Oh, man, it's, I think, yeah, there were so many different things just passing through my brain when you were saying that, and experiences, and then hearing other sisters' ex experience out there. Um, I don't know, I, uh, just starting with the, coming to a situation, unfortunately, a, lo a lot of times, we as women, or I, my experience has been, we have to come to these situations, a playing uh, situation, a gigs, sitting in with this armor on, mm -hmm. and we can't be our true authentic self. And this armor, it's like we're almost combating our, ourselves inadvertently while we're like, wait, what are you gonna say? Okay, you're gonna say this, uh-uh-uh. And you're just like <laughs> ready to, and so it, it comes sure. out through your, your playing and we're not able to, to tap in or to be free enough to tap into ourselves, And this is like a subconscious thing that goes on, but um, not free enough to tap into ourself um, in, in the most authentic and peaceful way because we're constantly guarding ourselves. I don't know if I'm really addressing oh, your yeah. question. Yeah, you're getting right um, there. It. You got it. It, it's and if challenge. you're guarding yourself, how can you how can you write? How can you compose? How can you arrange? How can you lead? How can you do these things if you are constantly worried about what might be said and how that might be perceived and what resources you'll be provided and what you'll need to do to prove exactly that you are worthy. But much of this I'm gonna interject has changed mm -hmm. because there are some incredible evolved men now around mm -hmm. us who are so excited about seeing women, you know, excel and more than that, be free and open with what they do. Yeah, to encourage, to encourage. It's, I think it's a, it's funny, I was just talking with a young lady in the 
premiere area and she just she kind of kneeled next to me I don't know if you're here but um if you are she kneeled next to me and she was like you know I just want to say thank you for the work that you and Ingrid and everybody else is doing because 40 years ago I used to play the saxophone and I remember sitting there in my class and it was a class full of women and um her teacher would say well you women are just here because you're trying to find a husband Ooh. <laughs> so that I think that perspective, you know, it, it's changed over time because I, I would, I think I'm safe enough to say that uh, the newer generation, uh, the millennials, um, we, I know I have conversations like this at Berkeley, but they're more open and more supportive. And so it's like, it's changing this, this ever standing mindset as uh, well, what's, what's the woman's position in the, um, in the workplace as a, as a musician. I think and in full circle, back to your first question for full circle, yeah. is that people are now, both women and men, are transcribing Melissa Aldana solos. Yeah. They're learning Jerry Allen tunes. And of course, I'm suggesting that in my comp class, which when I got into it, none of, I asked all of the guys in the class who their favorite composers were, and not one woman was mentioned. And I was like, okay, well, I'm here to change that. So right. while I'm here, they're all lifting Jerry Allen tunes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So, and, uh, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but we were also talking about how uh, just the in composition and having the grants and making sure that grants and um, you were saying something else. Just Yeah, the scholarships toward uh, female musicians, just the presence of us being, I mean, we've always been present. We, the more history books that I read, we've always been there and the precipice of the music, and I don't know why it's it's not oh. spoken about mm -hmm. more, because we have always been there. Because there's this question we had at the beginning about equality and equity, right? And so they're like, well, there's an equal number of women or men or whatever the case is, but if there's inequity in access, if there's inequity in information, if there's inequity in resources, unless those systems change, it mm -hmm. doesn't feel to me as though even even though there might have been a whole lot of us, if there's not a systems change plan in place and people aren't willing to accept the fact that the system itself is geared towards something that is not us, then there's no way that even, there could be hundreds of us, but if the bar for equity is not challenged, then those systems in place won't give us the access that we need. And, and that's what I'm seeing that, yes, you know, we're seeing, uh, say, in Montgomery County, where I live right now, in the last election, we just had the primaries, we had more women running than ever before. None of the women were elected. We had more women running than ever before, and none of the women were elected. And at the end of the day, you know, when women were, when people were polled about, well, why, why didn't you? There were a lot of great women. People would say, yeah, there were a lot of great women, but you know, I'll just feel comfortable if a, if a man is legislating mm -hmm. as we go through these rough wow. times. And so it's about helping people, but, but if you've never seen large groups of women in politics making those legislative changes that need to be made, if we still are fighting for basic human rights, and we are, if, we don't, if people don't see us in that place, you don't see us, you don't see us. Yeah. And, and these are the things that I think just having this conversation is really critical because people need to understand that just having us here is not enough. Having us here and having us as the artists in residence, having us here and having us talk about what's going to happen at the festival, having us here and figuring out what women's bands, what girls' bands, how we are adding more access, it seems to me that those things, that big dismantling needs to happen in order for that, yeah. for us to recognize that, yeah, women have been around, but they haven't been given the same mm -hmm. opportunity. They've, they've been there at the door, but if only a certain kind of person was allowed in, then it doesn't matter if you're standing by the door. Mm. Cecile, so I want to go back to 
your, the repertoire that you chose, you choose, um, and the conversation that we had a few minutes ago about kind of putting in people's face and saying, it's not all that pretty. You know, I may be coming and I may fit this stereotypical box that you think I should be in, but I really want to talk to you about something else. How, how, how are you, how can audiences better understand what it is that you are trying to bring, what it is that you are bringing to the table if people are blind <laughs> to what's happening. Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense to you no, there. No, you are. Um, I, I often like to sing old songs that are racist or sexist or both. Um, and, and sometimes I get a response like, oh, that song is so old. Isn't it crazy that people used to think that way? Mm. <laughs> And the reason that I choose these songs is because it's actually very current. There's there's a song that I love singing, which is this um, Josephine Baker song that she, she used to do um, called If I Were White. And it's basically about a woman who dreams to be, she would love to be a white blonde woman, like the dolls that she sees. And um, it's in French, unfortunately. <laughs> so I... I usually only sing it in France, but, um, but I do sometimes invariably, I'll get that reaction, like, oh, that's such an, oh. it's so sad that it's such an old song. And um, I don't want to respond like when I was growing up, that's something that I felt, you know? I felt ugly as a black, like because I was black, I felt like it was ugly. And that's something that we never talk about because especially, I think what's interesting is that in in the fact that we're always trying to like be positive and say, you know, black is beautiful and brown girls, you know, black girls rock and all this stuff, it's like we also don't necessarily always talk about these very private, horrible, disgusting thoughts that we have secretly growing up and that are actually poisonous um, and that end up erasing us, you know. Uh, so, so I guess I, I'm very attracted to those topics, and I like to, I like to sing them. But it's it's um, it's interesting because I I don't know who I'm who am I singing them to? You know, it's not an audience full of like young black girls or young black women, right. or like it, so so that so that's always like a strange thing that I'm grappling with. It's like. What am I saying really, and who am I saying it to, and is it does it does it really have a point? I don't know if it does sometimes. You know, am I just doing it for myself? Like I don't know. Um, so, I, it, am I even getting close to your question? You are. You are. But it's. It, I think. Mm. I think. I guess it. It brings me to the idea of like this genre of music is one that. It's it's an interesting, it's in an interesting place, and so to talk about these ideas of of equity and these progressive ideas of, you know, really shattering certain stereotypes, within a genre that is struggling, and that is having difficulty finding its audience, and let's face it, the audience has been dwindling for the last hundred years, you know, just more and more, so. How do we balance like the fact that you know we're playing jazz, we're playing this music, and also that we want to deal with all of these other ideas of like um, shattering certain stereotypes? I don't know. It's I, am I being clear? I don't know. It just seems it's a lot to to deal with. It's a it lot is. to to juggle. It is because you are also following a muse that you're not all the time in control of, right? The muse yeah. is telling you, I mean, Ingrid told me this great story about, about um, working on the Jerry Allen tribute and trying to figure out the music, and then before she knew it, her fingers were just moving and it was happening mm. because 
something got a hold of you. I, I figured that out about all the musicians I know. It's not that you are always in complete control of the way that you deal with this muse that makes you the creative you are. And I think that if this is what, this is your voice right now, it feels that just being able to do that and having then hopefully people will step back from your work and say, oh, this body of work she created at this time, this was this, and the statement that you're making is valid and it doesn't have to be yeah, approved by anyone. Yeah, it's just, it's it sometimes feels like making a, like screaming mm -hmm. with rage this yeah. statement of like, this is who I am and this is the rage that I feel and like nobody's listening, <laughs> you know? So it's like, y it's strange. It's really strange. But I think people are listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People are listening. <laughs> and you're starting a conversation. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you're starting a conversation but that it's really critical. And, yeah, I think, and most importantly, you're, you're being honest. Like, with what, even if it's you, we're using, we are using this as a platform to work our own out. Yeah. Yeah. For real, for real. Yeah. So if it's you're the only black strong woman in that room of a demographic, uh, this is me. The, yeah. And this is where, and you either take it or you don't. But this is like where I am right now. This is my platform for you to either be empowered or be disempowered or w neutral ground. But this is it. Uh -huh. So to be un unapologetic about that, I've had to learn that. Yeah. I've really had to learn that over years. <laughs> yeah, Tia. Yeah. But I think being around other strong women, you know, I mean, uh, I came from a, a strong mother, and then my father, Same. extremely supportive, black yeah. family. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thankful for that, to where I knew my mom was, you, you, you're dark, you're beautiful. Mm -hmm. She would always say, I'm but growing up in Aurora, Colorado, <laughs> you know, there were no other brothers really looking at me. <laughs> really, like some of them, but and so it wasn't until I went to Spelman and I was around mm -hmm. some more sisters and brothers and black queen, black. But it, it, I've learned, I've learned that if we can't celebrate ourselves, whether it be on stage or off stage, we we we, we don't need to look. I've, we don't need to look for others to, for their approval. Yeah. And, and our stage is our stage yeah. for our truth. Yeah. And yeah. you have, like, <laughs> Cecile, you know? <laughs> so just go. <laughs> no, That's I surreal. love you. <laughs> That's real. You're kind. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, though. It's very, that it's, it's very interesting because I also came from, like, a very affirming household, a matriarchal household. Mm -hmm. um, always encouraged, always pushed, always, like, you know really really told you're smart you're beautiful you need to work <laughs> yeah. um don't settle mm -hmm. you don't have to settle but there's these little yep. worms and snakes around <laughs> you go out and they just they just lodge themselves in and you it's i think it takes sometimes a lifetime to to try to extract some of them when you turn yeah. 30 it all changes <laughs> self-deprecating, very uh, self, I think it's just me, it's that's just gonna be me. <laughs> you know what, that's gonna become exhausting. You think so? Yes, it's gonna get to a point to where it, you're just gonna, cause it's so many other things coming at you that after a while you're gonna be like, F that, <laughs> yeah. I'm doing me. Yeah. I, man, yeah. I wish Diane Reeves was here. Oh, yeah. oh I, yeah. man, I wish yeah. she was here because we were kind of talking about this and she was talking about girl, you know how Diane is, yes. with her eyes all big and her <laughs> teeth like, girl, <laughs> I just realized I'm trying to keep my balance. Yeah. And I was like, Diane, how are you doing that? Because I feel like she was like, just stop. Yeah. And I was like, well, what do you, you know, she was like, my, my man, well, I don't want to tell her her business. <laughs> but, I mean, it's not that serious, but her manager is just asking about uh, when she's going back into the studio. And mm -hmm. she was like, I'm going to go back when I'm ready. When you're ready. Yeah. 
yeah. and it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it, it, uh, I just feel like in in this world, so many times we are as women so apologetic about our stance. That doesn't need to be the case mm. anymore. Mm. We're in a different age. It's never really had to be the case, but especially now, yeah. because we have support and there's a heightened level of consciousness in this in this atmosphere yeah. where people are like, oh, okay, and people are listening. Everybody's listening. Right. So I have a question. Yeah, to you. Yeah. I have a question actually. Is it basically dealing with that idea of like? Is there a responsibility as a public person, as somebody who's on a stage, to present and to exhibit a certain confidence and a certain self-love? Like, is that an important thing? Mm. You want to go ahead? I, I didn't for at least the first 12 years of my career. <laughs> no, I mean, how real do we want to be? That's really the question. Some days I'm you know, not feeling great. It's like, this is hard. The trumpet sucks sometimes. I just play the trumpet. I don't sing. I don't have any other means here to do this. And there were times earlier in my career when I had other issues I hadn't worked through, personal stuff and anxiety, whatever, self-deprecation. I have a triple major in self-deprecation <laughs> and uh, master's in I hate me and a triple doctorate in I suck. <laughs> Uh, but now that I'm, what am, what am I, am I 40 yet? No, I, now I have to say I'm 50. Now that I'm 50-something, I'm it's like, oh, why did I waste so much time on that? Yeah. Right. Last night I got on stage with my band, and we just, yeah. like, it was just a love fest. Yep. And, I, and, and to be in that space to play like that, it's like what I always wanted to be in, but I realized that the road is, as one of my mentors, Freddie Hubbard, said, it takes a long time to get good at this. And I don't think he was just talking about the trumpet when he said that. Now I look on it at it all, I'm like, I think it takes a long time to get good at all of this. Yeah. Yes. At, like, the yeah. balance, the sorting, the yeah. voices, the whatever, and, you know, and then things can happen to you and snap, you're on another level, and you want to really realize, like, having a baby, that's a big game changer for me. Yeah. It's like, things really stop mattering. Practice? Mm -hmm. I don't need to practice anymore. <laughs> I got this. I don't have time. I'd rather watch <laughs> Doc McStuffins or whatever than the flavor of the day is on the Sunday morning cartoons. But it's it's not even about that. It's just like the priorities really do change. And those voices, you're like, wow, why? where did I ever let those into my head? Right. And some of them definitely do come from a real energy of animosity. I'm, don't get me wrong. Right. You come out and you play trumpet well and you're you're hitting hard. And then there's some other guys that are like, well... I'm not comfortable with that. You can right. expect some flack oh, back. Yeah. Absolutely. That's just part of the Absolutely. competition. And and still, we're not seeing ourselves in, in multiples out there in the world. You still are pretty singular, you know? And so as a result, you don't see yourself. You don't see yourself and all that self-deprecation that you have, that learned behavior to kind of protect yourself, you know, because you're playing as hard as you can, but if you suck, then, you know, you played as hard as you can, but after all, you kind of suck, so you did the best you could. You know, it's, it's just so, oh, it's just such a heavy, wet blanket. That, yeah, and apparently uh, I guess women are supposed to know, look sexy all the time, too. That's yeah. one thing that I have no time for anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is what you get. If I didn't have time to put makeup on, I'm still going to play the same way as I do with or without makeup. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, Melissa, I, uh, full disclosure here, I, I worked at the Monk Institute for several years, and I did produce the Monk Institute competition for several years. And uh, I just thought it was a real tough place to be. Uh, it was tough, and I remember one year I produced the, uh, the event, and uh, Myra Melford was the only woman. And just just trying to be there in a very tough, competitive environment where there was just one woman and constantly trying to, to lift Myra up um, and to, to let her know that she belonged there and to, to try to keep her there, not have her running out mm -hmm. of the door, just, just, just saying, you do belong here. You, you do, your voice is important. 
it's a, it's a tough place. So a as you've moved through that now, and you are now moving into a very sweet place in your career, um, what are you what are you seeing now, and how are you able to take that experience and help uh, move you and perhaps others uh, through your career? Um, well, I have to say, like when I was there, I never. It never crossed my mind that I'm another woman and it's just guys, you know. I just felt like, okay, what do I have to say? Everyone is amazing, you know. Uh, Jimmy Heath, who amazing <laughs> saxophone player who happens to study with John Coltrane, you know, they've seen everything. Yeah. So I wasn't there thinking like, oh, I'm a woman and can I be a stronger? I was like, what is my story? And, and to me, winning back then, it meant to be able to be on the stage and just have fun and don't care, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I was able to play like I was at home, that's all what it matters, you know. And so when I started having the thought about being a woman, it was after I won, you know, that I read right. some things on Facebook. And I said, I guess like guys were just pissed off, you know. Um, they were. They were. You know, <laughs> because if you think like, I mean, I, I start doing like some thinking, you know, because I became insecure all the salary, all the salary, and I, I never been like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, it's Wayne Shorter, it's Ram for Marsalis, Jimmy Heath, like, they're not just gonna pick anybody, you know? And I remember when I won the competition, actually Jimmy Heath and, and Herbie came to me and they were like, you didn't win it because you're a woman. Awesome. So they were the first people making yes. me aware of that even, you know? Um, so, to me, I think that like the most important thing after winning the competition, which it didn't, to be honest, it doesn't mean anything to me, you know, but I can see how when I do clinics and when I go around and do master classes, there are young women that saw a woman, Latin American, you know, that won the competition and that really give them encouragement, you know, and I think that to me, that is the most important thing, you know, it's just like, just being able to see young women that are like, oh, we admire, like, we needed to have that, you know, like, just to be, yeah, women can do it, you know. So that is the most meaningful to me, to just be able to encourage young women. And, and when they come to me and they ask me, I'm like, well, just, just be strong, like, don't, don't care, you know, like, if you go to a jam session, because this is one of the questions I get that they, they mention often is that they go to jam sessions and they feel like, oh, everyone is vibing me because it's my woman and I feel insecure, you know. But I always try to say, you know, they vibe everyone. Everyone is just vibing each other. So that's a just word to start it's a with. a vibe fest. It should be called yeah. a vibe session, not a jam session. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's true or it's not. True. Like, I go to small yeah. and like, you know, I it's always true. been vibed out and I see how guys are mean to each other too, you know. So yeah. it's... It's not about gender, you know, so, but they need to hear that from a woman, they do. you know, they yeah. need to like see somebody that is making it and is just strong and be like, no, just don't care. Everyone is mean to each other. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the just word. It's just how it is. It's true. Great industry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you know what I mean. Do I, yeah. I do. I mm -hmm. do. I do. All right. So a lot has happened at Berkeley over the last year and you've been there. I'm sure, uh, talking with people about what your expectations are as educators in order to uh, shepherd in the next class, if you will, of young musicians who are looking up at you and saying, I want to do that, I want to be there. Um, what kinds of systems change overall do you think that jazz education needs to consider as we try to level the fa playing field for women at all levels in this music? Mm. Wow. Well, w one thing um, that Berkeley is also doing, and they're being more uh, conscious of it, is to hire more women. So more intention. Um, yes, more intention to hire more women and more minority women um, in particular. Um, minority women? Yeah, minority women. And, and this women is, of color. Wim, yes, yes, thank you, women <laughs> of color. <laughs> thank you. Because um, we are the majority. Yes, that's right, we are the majority, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm in, uh, or I'm a part of the ensemble department, and that's the largest department in the school. It basically houses all of all of the departments 
funnel through like the specialty, the instrumental departments funnel through the ensemble department. And there's about 500 different ensembles. Wow. Um, I teach about eight of them. And, um, but one of the things that our chairs are doing in uh, the, the performance division, uh, they're being more strategic about uh, hiring women and women of color. And, um, and also placing women in uh, more in upper administrative positions. Right. Um, so, you know, that's one thing, like Ingrid was saying, I think it's important when we step into this institutional environment that it looks like what the world looks like. It's representative. Right. And if you look at Berkeley's um, uh, faculty basis, it's very imbalanced. I would say that the ensemble department is uh, well ahead of every, like the composition department, it's um, pretty much Caucasian men with maybe a couple of women and every other department. So I think that's helpful in that, so that when we're talking about inequity or we're talking about systematic change, that we have those voices and that those hierarchies or the upper administrative positions to speak for the majority. What is the majority? And the majority would be us. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. What about um, recruiting, Ingrid? Uh, what do you know that's being done about recruiting students? I don't really know. I think that, as I said earlier, the people who are hiring from the top down, hiring people that are out doing what we're doing is one of the top recruiting things there is, the top recruiting tools is mm -hmm. seeing people at play. But then at the same time, you know, you want to have a teacher that's around. So this is one of the things about balance that I'm fighting right now is how to keep it all within the scope of being a mom, which is my priority, and then everything else after that. So it's... We just need more women that play well. That's my real answer to that. And that's what my husband said today. I said, what should I say in this panel, honey? Because, you know, you're kind of like one of the guys. You're like out there with all the guys talking about us. And that's cool. That's what they do. And not really. They're usually talking about beer. Um, he's usually talking beer? about beer. They're usually beer. talking about beer. beer. Beer is much more important than talking about, than oh, dissing women right. who can play well. Um, which is a, it just gives me hope. <laughs> um, but really what it, what, we, what it comes down to is like, well, just we just need more women that play on a high level. And my answer to that, my immediate reaction is, well, okay, then guys, you should probably start hiring some women that don't play that good, but you know are going to be reliable rather than keep hiring some dude over this late all the time or, you know, your boy that, that can't sight read and still can't play that part in tune. You know, it's just it's so change. obvious to me what can it's change here as a band leader change. and as a, as a parent. Right. It's just these are simple, logical things, but that is another mentality that has to just, you know, <laughs> yeah. slowly change. Yeah, it's like canoeing through... I don't know. There's only uh, so much you can do to recruit. That's my, my answer to the question is, mm -hmm. uh, real answer is we just need to see more of a balanced playing yeah. field of people that can really hit. And that takes mentorship. And that takes people like Bob Hurst coming into our band and going, man, I didn't even realize I was playing with a bunch of women. It was just, this is, he didn't mean that in a diss way or anything. He's like, I've never played with this many women mm -hmm. on at, at one time. And I, he was having a ball. Mm -hmm. We had the greatest time. I was like, well, that's weird. Because we didn't even really think that we were hiring women for this gig. We just hired Val and we hired, you know, Chris and Shami because that's who we hear in this context. Right. So, so Bria or Cecile, if you're a very young person and you think you want to sing or you think you want to be an instrumentalist, what kinds of things, what kind of messaging, where do we need to go to help young women realize that there is a place for them and that you can make a place for yourself in this world, um, you got lucky. But not everybody has that level of luck, right? And, and, and you are still talking about has, as you are moving through your career, Cecile, you're still you know, struggling with the same things that I have struggled with, that so many women I know have struggled with that may or may not be musicians, but those things, they're, they're pr pretty universal because 
inequity is pretty universal for women. So what kinds of things can we do together? And what message do we want to give to all these people in the room about what we can do together to try to change the systems that have kept so much inequity in place? So I, I believe there is a growing field of opportunity right now, and here's why. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been on both sides of uh, you know the, the business in a lot of ways, band leading, playing, but also have been on uh, organization committees for jazz festivals along the way, and um, including one in New York City. I've started a jazz camp, um, and my husband is a artistic director at a major concert venue in New York City, so I get a bit of intel on what producers are thinking these days, which is a big piece of the puzzle. You know, we can do the institutions, we provide the players, the players exist, where do they go? Who is programming right now? Um, and we'll talk about this festival and how they're doing a really good job of that in a second, you know. Um, but the pressure, I believe the pressure is on, at least if New York City is any barometer for the rest of the, you know, the world, to uh, obviously show diversity, you know, if you don't have women, if you don't have people of color in your cast, in your series, in your programming right now, you are behind the curve. You are not doing your job because they exist. Exactly. Um, and I've even had, you know, there are producers, presenters out there that, you know, as a, as a white person, they say, you know, there needs to be, I want to see diversity in your group specifically. That's not necessarily, I mean, I have a diverse group band because I love these guys, the way they play, et cetera. But there's an accountability conversation that's happening uh, between producers of events and festivals and every now and then, you know, within musicians in, in my position um, to do that. Uh, so that's good. Uh, the festival here, again, is an excellent, <laughs> you know, they're doing exactly what's need to be done. You decide and you execute. It's not that hard. You just have to decide and then do it. Then that's what they're doing. Um, I believe there should be, you know, a 360 diversity across the whole scene. One of the biggest fields why we haven't been reading about women in books for so long is because the writers, the critics, you know, there's no diversity in the critics. Um, that's the only time I've felt, I won't get into that story, but... Not much diversity. Yeah, yeah not much, true, yeah. At least not equal, equity, equal. Um, yep. So those, but I believe that there is a growing uh, pressure and conversation among those parties to deliver that. Um, you know, kudos to Danny Melnick for putting together the group that we're performing with this weekend, as well as Tim Jackson. And I want uh, you to know that you all have uh, a vote and a say in this. You are the paying customers. You demand what you want to see, and they will have to answer. You know, so that's all I have to say yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What, what she said. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it is something that I was going to ask earlier, is who are the people making the decisions? Uh, who are the people programming? Who are the people writing about the music? Who are the people running the labels? Who are the agents and the managers? Like, who are those, like, who are those what people? do those people look like? And then... You know, the, then the question is, how do we change that so that there's it's a little bit more sprinklings of other things in that group of people? I don't know. Um, maybe it's also like us starting our own festival somewhere too. You know, yeah. you, like taking there's, there's control taking control and there's and there's there's technology there's the internet which is a horrible place but also a place where we can take back control and create things and so that's it the, po the like you said the possibilities are are really opening up so it also i think will take musicians having and and when i say musicians i I'm now meaning female musicians, queer musicians, to take charge and to get other skills other than, unfortunately, other skills other than playing their instrument, which is something that I'm sure we've all had to deal with, uh, and, and putting those skills to use in organizing ourselves, you know. I think that's a good point. I think holding people accountable 
is critical. And whether you consider yourself, you know, just a musician, just an arranger, just a composer, or you look at yourself in a completely different light, I think that life is about give and take, right? You have to have these relationships and partnerships in order to fuel your business and, and move forward. Mm -hmm. But if the intention that you talked about earlier, Tia, uh, and the focus is that you will be moving forward, not only for yourself, but for all of the things that you embody, then I think holding those partners accountable and saying, well, if I do business with you, you have to do these things. If I, if I play on this festival, it has to look like this. Mm -hmm. If I am making this recording, these people need to be in place. If I'm making this film, these people must be in positions of power. And I think that when we are able to shift the dynamics that way, and we are able to hold people accountable and have this vision about what it is that we want to do while letting our muse do whatever it's going to do with us, that I think may be some of the keys that we need. And I think some of the keys that the audience can use in order to ensure that many more festivals will look like this panel does today and that many more people will be the better for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. I, I, um, I would be remiss in not mentioning this, but also uh, I feel like I'm the spokesperson for Berkeley, which I'm not, not by any means, but... Um, so Terry Lynn Carrington is just starting a new um, institution called Jazz and Gender Justice. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and for those uh, who aren't aware, uh, and I don't want to speak for her, um, but and I know you said that you didn't want to speak, Dr. Davis, but she's she's on the committee. Would you would you be willing just to explain more about Jazz and Gender Justice? I could give more of an overarching. Thing. But basically, it's this institution for young women um, to come in. It's similar. No, okay. See, I, I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> but is it, would you like to? Would you like? Okay, please uh, welcome. Yeah. Yes. Yay! Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I didn't even put you on the spot. Talk to you. Put her on the spot. <laughs> she told me she's like. I told you I was a tenth I, I wanted to learn from you. I know, I know. But it's been a really fascinating uh, conversation, so I'd like to thank you know all of you for your contributions. Um, uh, yeah, Terry Lynn Carrington invited uh, me and Gina Dent to be on the advisory committee for uh, the Institute for Jazz and Gender Justice at Berkeley um, College of Music. The, the slogan is jazz without patriarchy. And so that, that involves not only guaranteeing that larger numbers of, of women and perhaps gender non-conforming people will be invited uh, into the jazz community, um, but also thinking about the music itself. You know, what might it mean uh, for um, jazz to no longer be primarily a masculine music? Yeah. And uh, yesterday we were having a conversation, um, um, and I think um, Gina, whose field is literature, was pointing out that um, in the 1970s, American literature looked very different. Yes. Um, Toni Morrison was not a part of the canon of American literature. Mm -hmm. um, and during the period of the 80s, large numbers of women, actually largely due to Toni Morrison's role as an editor at Random House, uh, were, were published. And now the literature looks entirely different. Mm. And so I think we can say that the 
that jazz cannot really uh, move towards its full potential without inviting people of all genders uh, from um, to um, give expression to a multiplicity of experiences. You know, jazz has always been at the forefront of social justice with respect to racial issues, yes. right? Uh, jazz has uh, actually helped to create arenas for struggle. Jazz musicians created the terrain for the civil rights movement to occur. And many people aren't aware of the fact that interracial jazz bands travel throughout the South um, and I don't, I don't want to give a lecture here. <laughs> <laughs> Preach! <laughs> uh, but, I th but we're now confronted with the fact that, in many ways, with respect to gender, jazz is very backward. Mm -hmm. It hasn't kept up with the rest of the country, the rest of the world. And this is an exciting period, and I think that um, Berkeley is doing an amazing job of um, um, uh, moving out uh, and taking leadership and showing other jazz institutions what can be done. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Angela Davis. The Angela Davis. are and it is about time for us to sew up our panel. I'm getting the high sign from behind the curtain. So before I leave you today I wanted to ask is there anything left unsaid that must be said about the change that must happen if we are to grow? If I may, then I would just like to read this code of conduct to give, I know there are a lot of young women out here who are in institutions and on the scene and doing their thing. I see one of my sisters here. But um, just to give you some tools, uh, feel free to go to We Have Voice Code of Conduct. You can find it online. And if you're in a situation in, in the school or wherever that you're uncomfortable, you can. these are some clear guidelines that, can, that you can access so that you're not remaining in that uncomfortable space. So the whole thing is how can we commit to creating safer spaces in performing arts? And the first one is speak up, seek support, or ask for help. I just had an issue with one of my students at Berkeley last week where I had admitted another student and she was like, Tia, I'm uncomfortable because something happened a couple years ago and I've never really dealt with it and I didn't tell anybody and now he's here in the ensemble. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, what? So speak up, go to counseling. There's, there's, um, there's counseling services uh, provided by schools. There's, there's friends, there's family. Make sure you speak up. The second one is create mechanisms and or designate persons in your workplace to promote and provide uh, support when needed, allowing people to raise their concerns without fear of retaliation. You can read, I'm gonna give you just the bullet points. You can read the um, subtext. The third one is communicate your institution's anti-harassment policies and zero tolerant pro tolerance protocol. The fourth one is work collectively to combat bias and stereotypes. Fostering diversity, that's something that we were talking about. What does, is the space looking like? How can you, ro your role as an um, educator or as a student, how can you foster diversity so that it creates a safer space? Um, how is sexual harassment defined by law? Um, also, what is defining what a workplace is for you and for your atmosphere, your environment? Also, identifying what is consent, whatever that looks like. And this this is really deep. There's so many different gradients because th there's cons there's consent, and then you we have this power dynamic that that kind of coexists with teacher student. Right. So you have to really be clear, and also in more um, more casual environment. You know, there's been times where I played, and you know, some dudes just pat me on my behind. And when I was young, I didn't say anything, but now I would. So knowing that <laughs> that you speak up, and what is consent, and then the last is what impacts consent. 
between force, power dynamics, abuse of power, and so on. So uh, for those of you who just need something to access, we're actually tapping into different institutions and performing arts and um, having different individuals and um, institutions to sign to this We Have Voice conduct just to hold people accountable. That's it. So. Yeah. It. Awesome. Thank you, Tia. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening and for hearing us. Melissa Aldana, Cecile McLaurin Salvant, Bria Stromberg, Ingrid Jensen, Tia Fuller. This is what it looks like. Have a great day. Well done, Susan. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you.